So when I wrote Ex Guest T, the, the main target of my research was my wife, and I wrote a blog called How, How I Can Find My Wife with Essie Lennox. And the way she is, she's a dental hygienist, okay, knows nothing about computers. Right? She gets on the computer probably for an hour or two every day. She reads her email, she browses the web. That's the only thing she ever does on the computer. She doesn't administrate it. She doesn't know what a root password e would even mean. She doesn't know what a home directory is. Okay? She just uses the computer for web access. And so when I de developed a policy for her, I realized, hey, this works for a real large class of users. As a matter of fact, that class of users, oh, I'm missing my, that class of users is growing all the time. Right? The users that use a device like this or a tablet, someone here had a tablet, is really not dealing with the home directory. They're dealing pretty much the network internet all the time. So I built XGuest policy with her in, her in mind, and she's been running XGuest policy for a couple of years now. So I looked around the rest of the house and found some other candidates. <laughs> now, actually, I'm flying home tomorrow and hopping in a car to see if this guy actually graduates from university this week. So we're hopeful. We're not quite sure yet. <laughs> okay. And then my other one is graduating from high school, and he'll be going to university in the fall. But the interesting thing about those guys is they don't use a computer like I did when I was in college. You know, I had the line printing, eh, eh, eh. But even some of the younger guys in, here, in this room, guys in their late 20s to early 30s, use computers much differently than they're using now in colleges. Right? Believe it or not, people used to go to stores and buy a box with a book in it and a spinning disk. And they used to bring that home and they'd plug it into a computer and load software off of it. You know, it's just infallible that people would actually do that. But that's the way you know, we did it. The way they do it, they never install software. They go on and they click on buttons. They go to Facebook, they go to Twitter, they go to other types of places, they use Office documents, they use, you know, I mean not Office documents, they use Google Docs, right? They are totally web-based. And they expect all their content to be available on the web, not on their computer, because it has to be available on their cell phone, or it has to be available on their tablet, and it has to be available on the, on the computer at the, uh, you know, the library. So they expect all their content to be up on the web, and that's the way the world's going. But why do those users need to send to port 25? Why do they have to send massive amounts of spam out the mail port? My son, the baseball player, um, actually caused the local internet provider to shut down port 25 off my house. <laughs> okay? I don't think he was sending mail out of port 25. I'm not sure what happened, but he was running Believe it or not, I allowed Windows in my house at one time. So my house is totally Windows free at this point. It's, it's rather dark, but it is. <laughs> uh, you know, so we allow these users to connect to these random ports. We allow these users to be administrators, to try to run sue and sudo, to accidentally run an application that's labeled incorrectly and become root, or at least processes that they accidentally started to be able to do that. So aren't these users all candidates for XGuest? Just connect to web ports. It's the only thing you're allowed to do on your desktop. At Red Hat, there's over 4,000 employees now. About 3,000 of them don't know what the root password on the computer is. So why do we allow them to administrate it? Why is their administrative tools even installed on there? So user T, you know, they might connect to, they probably have some old software that needs to connect to random network ports. So we have to allow them to connect to all ports, but they don't execute things in their home directory. The only time that happens is if they're getting hacked. So why do we allow them to, you know, to run su, sudo? Shouldn't be allowed to. So all these candidates, about 3,000 people at Red Hat have managed desktop accounts. IT manages them. So IT should basically shut down their access to those users. These guys I would never touch. You can't confine them because they're just going to turn the damn thing off by causing them any hack or the hassle. So they should run by default as unconfined T. 
So I even can be, can, can find this guy with his cheesy mustache at the time. And the idea, the way I run my computer, and I've run it for about probably three years at this point with Staff T. And with Staff T, um, what I sometimes set up, right now I have it going to sysadmin T, but when I go through sudo, I set it up to go to unconfined T. So as an administrator, I'm unconfined T, but as a non-administrator, I'm Staff T. What that does is it prevents me from accidentally executing a set UID application that I don't even know is on the system and becoming root. So if staff T becomes root, he starts blowing up because he has no ability to do the things that root wants to be able to do. So the only way I become an administrator of my machine is actually going through sudo, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. But I even can confine myself and stop my, my own account from having a problem. The last part of um, the talk on users is on these things. When you use a kiosk box, what users do you have to worry about? <coughs> every user that ever used the computer before you and every user that ever uses the computer after you. Because if I use a computer before you, I can leave a spy on there and wait for you to do online banking. And trust me, there's lots of online banking happening at the libraries. And I can watch your keystrokes and capture it and then I can do online banking very happily. If you use a computer and leave it, when I come on, I'm going to see you went to Amazon.com. You might even leave Firefox going. So I could P-trace Firefox and actually find out what your credit card data was inside of it. All right? So that anybody that uses a kiosk machine is vulnerable. So we developed, I, I actually hacked together something in Fedora called the Kiosk Operating System. Uh, Fedora also has the ability to build these live CDs. Have you, everybody seen the live CDs? USB sticks and live CDs. They're basically read on the operating system. So as soon as you pull it out, put it back in, reboot the machine, it's a brand new, active, totally clean operating system. So what I did is I built the kiosk operating system on a live CD platform. I actually catted uh, dev random into the password, because password, uh, the root password, I mean. So that the root password is totally disabled. I don't even know what it is. No one in the world knows what the root password is. But the rest of the operating system, the only user on it is the XGuest user. And the XGuest user is actually set up, there's actually a package. You can do yum install XGuest, and that'll install the XGuest user and the, well, this special user. This user temp has a temporary home directory and a temporary temp directory. When you log out, his home directory and temp directory get destroyed. When he logs in, it gets recreated every single time. So it's a good use case for a kiosk operating system. It also will only work if it's linked to the enforcing mode. I set it up so it boots without being an uninterruptible boot. So basically, you put this thing in a machine, you know, however you get it into the machine secured. You don't have to put an operating system on a machine, just a live CD or a live USB, and suddenly you have a secure kiosk. If someone has scooted around with it, you can log out, you can destroy it, um, or just reboot it, and suddenly you have a fresh, clean operating system. Every time you want to do a security update, you just re rebuild it and put it on a USB stick, and you're all set to go. So I thought it was a pretty cool idea. I went to my boss with a business proposition. I said, we can get money out of libraries. They're just rolling in the dough, ready to spend money. And for some reason, he didn't like my business proposition. So, But what we looked at, is there's lots and lots of other kiosk opportunities besides just libraries. Schools, colleges, uh, airports, you guys have a lot of these, you know, pay a euro for 10 minute uh, kiosk places. So, you know, there is actually a potential use. We've actually shown this to the Department of Defense um, in the U.S. And, and they have kiosk boxes where soldiers walk up to and they swipe their cat cards and suddenly they're logged into their medical records. So, you know, machines like that, it's lots and lots of uses. What about cash registers? Or if you go to a store and they have their online store presence, so you can't buy something local, they say go online store. So there's lots of opportunities actually for this, this operating system. Uh, we'll see if it's actually used. <coughs> 